Hi everyone. Today we're diving into an instrumental data structure called the Bloom Filter. If you've ever wondered how to check membership in a set quickly without using too much memory, this one's for you. Let's get started. So, what is a Bloom Filter? It's a probabilistic data structure used to check if an element is part of a set. Now here's the catch. Bloom Filters guarantee no false negatives. If it says an element isn't in the set, it's absolutely correct. However, they do allow false positives. That means it might say an element exists when it actually doesn't. It's incredibly memory efficient and super fast. This package is a lightweight and efficient Go library for implementing Bloom filters. It allows you to add elements to a filter and check their existence with minimal memory usage and configurable false positive rates. Ideal for scenarios like deduplication, caching and pre-filtering large datasets, this package provides a simple API for creating robust, scalable applications. Let's install this package with this command. Now that the package is installed, let us look at the project we are going to use to demonstrate the use of this package. Imagine a web application where you frequently need to check if the user has access to a feature or not. This needs to be checked on every API request. Instead of querying the database for every request, you can use a Bloom filter to reduce unnecessary queries for IDs that definitely do not exist. Let's look at this application. We will start from main.go. In the main function, we have an API defined. This API feature access checks if the user has access to a specific feature. This is the handler. Here the server is started. It runs on port 8080. Let's look at models first. In setup.go, we have this function db in it that initializes the database connection. This function is called in the application's init function. In seed.go, we have a function that seeds the databases. Let's look at the model that defines the user's access to features. This structure, user access, models the relationship between users and the features they can access. It has two fields, user ID, which is the primary key, and feature ID. These fields map directly to the database table using GORM annotations. The function user feature access takes two arguments, user ID and feature ID. It returns a Boolean value indicating whether the user has access to the feature. Let's go back to the seed function. It seeds the database with sample user feature access data. Now we will look at the API handler that checks if the user has access to a feature. It reads user ID from the request query parameters and converts it to an integer. Next we read the feature ID and also convert it to an integer. The user feature access function which is implemented in the models package is called with the extracted user ID and feature ID. This function confirms access by querying the database. Here we send the response. Let's see this in action. The server has started. Now, when we hit the API with this user ID and feature ID, we get access as true. Here, we can see the database is queried to find the access. Let's try a different feature ID. This time the access is false. Here is the database query that our application has performed.
In a real-world application, this kind of check for the access might be required on each API hit. The Bloom filter comes handy in such cases. It reduces database queries that we need to perform. Let's add a Bloom filter in this application. We will begin from the setup. Here, we define a variable for the Bloom filter. Similar to db init, we will create a function that sets up the Bloom filter. We use the new with estimates method from the Bloom filter library to create a new Bloom filter. The first argument, 10,000, is the estimated number of elements we expect to add to the Bloom filter. The next argument, 0.01, .01, is the desired false positive rate, which we've set to 1%. It means the filter might mistakenly report a false positive once in every 100 queries. These parameters are crucial to provide an accurate estimate because it affects the filter's memory usage and performance. In the later part of the video, we will learn how this package helps us estimate these parameters. We need to call this function in the init function in main.go. Now let's go to seed.go and fill the Bloom filter with various user ID and feature ID combinations. In a real application, you might have to read the database and provide these combinations to the Bloom filter. Here, for each access combination, we create a key that is concatenation of the user ID and the feature ID. We concatenate them with a colon in between to create a unique key. Next, on the Bloom filter, we call the add function to add the key. It accepts bytes, not a string. VS Code automatically converts it to a slice of bytes. Let's go to the model function, which queries the database to check if the user has access to a feature. Here, we'll check the Bloom filter to quickly determine if this user feature combination might exist in our access data. Next, we construct a unique key for this user feature pair. We convert both user ID and feature ID to strings and then concatenate them with a colon. Here's the first Bloom filter check. We use the test method to see if the key exists in the filter. This function returns a Boolean. If the key isn't found, we immediately return false. This means the user definitely doesn't have access, saving us the need for a database query. In the init function, we will uncomment the seed function to fill the bloom filter. Let's try this out now. Here, the access is true. In this case, the DB query is performed as the Bloom filter can give us a false positive. Now, in this case, the access is false. The Bloom filter works in this case and avoids the database query. Sometimes, the actual false positive rate may differ from the theoretical false positive rate. The Bloom filter provides a way to verify the false positive rate. We are going to implement this in an API for demonstration. In the main function, we register a new endpoint. Estimate FP for estimating Bloom filter parameters. Let's implement this handler function. Now, we define a struct for the response. Estimate API response holds detailed information about the Bloom filter's false positive rate, including estimated parameters and accuracy. It has the following attributes. This is the estimated false positive rate of the Bloom filter. 
Estimated M is the estimated size of the bloom filter in bits required to achieve the desired false positive rate. Estimated K is the estimated number of hash functions to be used by the bloom filter to optimize its false positive rate. Desired FP rate is the desired false positive rate specified by the user for configuring the bloom filter. Expected accuracy is a descriptive message indicating how closely the estimated false positive rate matches the desired false positive rate. Let's look at the estimate FP handler function. It will handle requests for estimating the bloom filter's parameters based on the number of elements and a desired false positive rate. We extract two query parameters, N for the number of elements and desired FP rate. Here, we check if any parameter is missing, we return an error. Next, we convert n to an integer and validate it to ensure it's a positive value. Similarly, we pass desired FP rate as a float and validate that it falls between 0 and 1. Once we have valid inputs, we estimate the optimal parameters for the bloom filter using the bloom.estimate parameters method. It calculates the size of the filter, m, and the number of hash functions, say k, based on the number of elements and the desired false positive rate. Using the calculated parameters, we also estimate the actual false positive rate using estimate false positive rate. This helps verify how close the estimated rate is to the desired rate. Now we prepare a JSON response. For this, we use the estimate API response struct to neatly organize the calculated data. The first field in the response is estimated FP rate, which is the actual false positive rate we calculated. Next, we include estimated M, which represents the optimal size of the bloom filter in bits. We also include estimated K, the number of hash functions recommended for the filter. The desired FP rate field reflects the false positive rate the user specified in the request. Finally, expected accuracy contains a descriptive message comparing the estimated false positive rate to the desired rate. It highlights any percentage difference. We use the JSON encoder to serialize the response struct into JSON format and write it back to the client. Let's try this API. Here, we are passing M as 10,000 and the desired FP rate as 0.01. .01. Estimation gives us back this response. Here, we can clearly see the false positive rate is within 0.2% of the desired rate. That's it for today's episode on using Bloom filters in web applications. We saw how they reduce unnecessary database queries, optimize performance, and stay memory efficient. With simple setup and parameter estimation, you can easily integrate them into real-world use cases like access control. If this was helpful, give it a thumbs up, subscribe for more Golang tutorials, and drop your questions or ideas in the comments. Thanks for watching, and happy coding!